From the time we're very young, we're taught to worship authority because that's our key to survival as young children. But as adults, we never go through the rites of passage that tell us how to methodically think for ourselves, and thus we're always in a state of extended adolescence. To the degree that the individual loses a sense of what freedom really means for himself, mind control is working. This is the constant battle and the struggle. Fatalism, defeatism, what Barb Morley called mental slavery. That's this huge thing that he would sing about. How do we emancipate ourselves from mental slavery? Have we moved to that point of such slavery that we're too far gone? I think one of the biggest aspects of it is the 15,000 hours of compulsory schooling. You know, we're taught not to question, we're taught to accept information on authority and regurgitate useless facts, not how to think, not how to be a, a person and, and think critically. Uh, that's got to be one of the most integral parts of it. I would say in the next 50 years, if large numbers of people don't become consciously resistant to the overall mind control exerted on society, we're going to see many more people who really truly resemble androids. People induce this themselves by looking out at the world and saying, it's too dangerous for me to tell the truth or to say what I really believe or express how I really feel. It's much better if I fabricate a completely synthetic personality that's going to sit back here and remain passive. That's how it works. Since the dawn of time, small groups of human beings have instilled artificial circular limitations on the minds of their subjects through the procession of history. Traditionally, the limitations are imprinted on the servile population through a cunning use of language, instruction, and media for the purposes of conquest social cohesion, and authoritative order by harnessing the human resources of the broad population is that of the struggle between the state, whatever its form, and the individual, the goal of which is to harness and subsume the individual, willingly or unwillingly, into its group collective. The role of authority is a predatory system that sees the individual as a unit of energy. The first forms of mind control go back to prehistory, and you would simply have a priest class that developed technologies of herbs and medicine and had a value to the tribe. But pretty soon the priest class would start studying the sky and when there were solar and lunar eclipses and would say, hey, uh, the sun's not going to come back on this date unless you make me king or unless you give me total control. And the people would say, okay, we saw the eclipse when you said it was coming. You know, the snake god ate the sun of the moon. What do you want? I want your firstborn child, sacrifice him to me. Every culture does that. Every culture at one time or another demands human sacrifice because that's the state or the priest class demanding absolute, total fealty and submission to it. Mind control has existed since the dawn of time. Only the methods have changed. Elites have always known, if I can control the minds of my people, I control them. Only the technology has changed. It's still the same program. It's never stopped. Sun Tzu, within the works of the art of war, talk about the fact that if you can understand your enemy so well to the level of where you can psych him out, basically defeat him before you put one boot on the battlefield, you, you've become a true master of your domain. The Greek author Plato embedded several key characteristics of ruling groups in his monumental work known as the Republic. Therein, he introduces the term cybernetics as a description of steering the ship of state, emphasizing crowd control. Plato memorialized the essence of the scenario used to control individuals to this day, to make them part of the group or state. This is famously known as the allegory of the cave, a useful strategy which is emblematic of the history of mind control. The idea of cybernetics first shows up in Plato's Republic and in the Greek original text, it's read kybernetes, but you can easily discern how this word tied into cybernetics, the control of not only nations, but how the making of individuals into the collective that forms the nations came about. As we've moved through history, every great leader has had to understand the, the potential of information, the potential of speech, the potential of words, the potential of books. In an attempt to assist the state, a 14th century Italian named Niccolo Machiavelli crafted several books intended to help the ruling elite dominate their subjects with the most effective psychological warfare techniques available to the world at that time. And he was trying to 
convert the Medici family into hiring him to provide political advice. Conspiracy is the story of history. It's the story of plunderers taking care of people who produce. They claim to take care of them through government, which doesn't give you anything. It doesn't take away first. So it's not creating something out of nothing. It's very real what they're doing. They're taking your rights or taking some people's rights and adding more to someone else's rights. Concurrent to Machiavelli's efforts, the consequences of tyranny were sowing the seeds of liberty throughout Europe. So this whole idea of Machiavelli telling the ruling elite how to do this in a more efficient and effective manner without people directly knowing about it. But his mistake is that these books get out there and other people start to read these books because it's not just the ruling elite. This starts to have an influence in Europe. You've got a character named Etienne de la Boetti who writes a discourse on voluntary servitude. And basically what de la Boetti does is he shows you that everything that Machiavelli told the ruling elite about how to control you is undone when you understand it to the nuts and bolts level where you can then withdraw your consent and that only then are you free. Innovative and enigmatic German philosopher of the 19th century, Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, observed that human history could be manipulated to create a contrived outcome. Hegel's essential observations of the methods by which history may be authored by a small group translate into a world in which an individual's choices may be engineered away from his needs. In his 1928 book, The Open Conspiracy, former British psychological warfare expert H.G. Wells wrote, The political world of the open conspiracy must weaken, efface, incorporate, and supersede existing governments. The character of the open conspiracy will then be plainly displayed. It will be a world religion. This large, loose, assimilatory mass of groups and societies will definitely and obviously attempt to swallow up the entire population of the world and become a new human community. The immediate task before all people, a planned world state. But in 1948, Eric Blair, the British journalist and author who assumed the nom de plume of George Orwell wrote the iconic dystopian novel, 1984. In it, Orwell outlined a collectivist future governed by technocrats in which a big brother totalitarian state maintains control of society through constant panopticon-inspired surveillance, fueled by a perpetual war and emboldened by both covert and overt forms of mind control and mass persuasion. Orwell's notion of doublespeak demonstrated the cognitive dissonance inherent in tyrannical structures, leveraging the fact that the 20th century opened up numerous avenues for shaping and controlling the thoughts and behaviors of the population. The ruling elite contrived new ways of obscuring useful facts while peddling useless ideas to the American people. One such artifact of credible evidence is a 1966 textbook authored by Georgetown professor Dr. Carol Quigley titled Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time. In it, Quigley details a secret society partially funded by central banker Lord Rothschild, enacted by Cecil Rhodes and led by Lord Alfred Milner and the Round Table Journal of International Affairs, which Quigley terms the Milner Group. This is a key book. It's almost like the Rosetta Stone to decode everything they're doing. It's over a thousand pages long with incredible documentation in the bibliography of how this ruling elite based out of Britain is using a full spectrum dominance model to fund the communists, to fund the fascists, to fund the Democrats, to fund the Republicans, so that there looks like there's a choice, but everything really is moving towards collectivism for the general public, while the elite themselves are exempt from all their own rules. Once the power structure got all the best and brightest students of the world and put them through Rhodes Scholar type programs, not just in England, but in other nations, they could then control the brain trust and have a fully programmed new generation to take control of the governmental, corporate, and media systems to carry out the program. Their goal was to dominate all of those major power centers quietly behind the scenes. And by moving the leadership in a certain direction, then they knew that they could control the masses without the masses even knowing that they're being dominated and led by a very small, powerful elite group. 
In further pursuit of the science of controlling human resources, the last will and testament of Cecil Rhodes spawned the Pilgrim Society in both America and England, which created a global brain trust. Its goal? To assert global control by dividing its tasks into working groups, such as the Council on Foreign Relations, Bilderberg Group, and Trilateral Commission throughout the 20th century. In more recent history, the long-held beliefs of the ruling class regarding control of the individual's body by the undermining of his mental abilities were then furthered by the technological breakthroughs of the 19th and 20th centuries. In the 19th century, the Prussian government conducted research into the study of how to make individuals compliant cogs in the machine of their conflict-based empire. Prussian psychologist Wilhelm Wundt determined that the individual human being has no soul and can thus be programmed like an automaton or robot. Our system is copied from a 1819 Prussian system that's a three-tiered education system. One tier is for the intellectual elite. The second tier is for the servers of the intellectual elite. They would be the professionals, the doctors, the lawyers. And the last tier is for the lay. It's for the masses. Education, as we know it, is nothing more than mind control. It is the science of control. And the British scientists, the eugenicists, came up with systems to dumb people down and make them submissive. But the Prussian model that was designed to create soldiers that were owned by the state, but that were so brainwashed, they were proud to go off and march into musket fire. That system known as kindergarten is the whole basis of modern Western education. The greatest barrier to discovery is not ignorance. It's the illusion of knowledge, and that's what the 15,000 hours in compulsory schooling really in, in trains and conditions into us. And so you think you know about it. And it's not until later in life when you might come across more information about conquistadors and how Jesuits infiltrated all their religious systems and, and took all the riches out and harvested this whole area. And this is the example of plunder in South America that went on for hundreds of years. So until you have this other piece of information to bring this into focus, you think that what you were taught in public schooling during that 15,000 hours is really what's going on. And it's not until you bump up against reality, as George Orwell said, on a, usually on a battlefield, that you have to consider that which you were taught to believe versus the objective evidence that exists. John Taylor Gatto was an award-winning educator in New York who took kids that couldn't even read or write, were headed for prison, and made them top-level students. And then he discovered that he was shut down by the big tax-free foundations so that he couldn't teach the children this information. He discovered that it was by design that they were dumbing people down to make them subservient biological androids or replicants. That's what we're seen as. But now we're obsolete. We're to be phased down the new robotic systems, the drone aircraft, the drone submarines, the drone ships, the drone robots on the ground. We're all being conditioned, all being acclimated for this. No organization of the size and scope of Tavistock can operate for long without ample funding. From whom is that funding derived? Certainly no small part comes from the seemingly benign tax-exempt foundations of the global elite. I was researching the Reese Committee back in 1952, 1953, where they went in and investigated major foundations and some of their subversive activities. These foundations put an enormous amount of energy into controlling what is being taught at the schools and how it's being taught and preparing, using schools basically to indoctrinate children to accept their station in life, to accept a collectivist future. The real goal was to change America from an individualist system into a collectivist system and in which case it could be merged with the rest of the world and there would be this great new world order that we hear so much about in recent years. The purpose of creating tax-exempt foundations was not just to collect more money, but to invisibly assert influence over the power centers which control the programming of individuals, specifically to breed the self-reliance out of individuals and prepare them for the collectivist lifestyle planned by the ruling class. Their goal to undermine personal liberty on biological, social, and economic levels. This is how, for example, men of small stature could keep otherwise brave and ferocious gladiators as household slaves whose deaths could be used for profit and entertainment. 
Out of the ashes of World War II rose the specter of human experimentation. How will power gravitate into the hands of those who control information through the internet, through wireless networks, through smart grids, smart devices, and smart meters to monitor and control the personal behavior of every citizen in the grid? How has the role of harnessing the minds of human resources shaped the 20th and now the 21st centuries? This single pattern emerges from all the seeming chaos. National elections is not equal to democracy. Democracy means you really have some power over things that affect your life. But when Americans think that their democracy equals national elections, and they have senseless wars and corporate control with a Republican in office like George W., and they think, well, we're going to stop these senseless wars and corporate control, and we're going to go and vote for Obama, this Democrat, and they get, what do they get? Senseless wars and corporate control. And so there's a kind of learned helplessness that sinks in there. How are the attitudes, beliefs, behaviors, and values of a society transformed such that the needs of the individual are always in conflict with the demands of the group? The early 20th century trend of conspicuous consumption or the trading of that which is valuable and sensible for that which is superficial and frivolous swept over America and other countries around the world with the help of a few minds who were focused on changing our lives before we were even born. How does one defend themselves against strategic information, propaganda? It's a very simple answer. Ask questions. Always check your source. I look at everything. To me, with the media just willing to report whatever the government tells it to report, that, that gives the government free reign to create whatever story or narrative it wants to create for whatever purpose it wants to create a story for. And that's where we're at. Cognitive dissonance occurs when individuals lack consistency in their methods of thinking, and thus, contradictory elements attempting to reside simultaneously as fact create frustration, confusion, anger, and aggression. It is the difference between what you think the world is and what the world actually is. Psychiatry itself as a profession is one gigantic mind control operation. You can have a psychiatrist testify in court that somebody has ADHD or clinically depressed or this or that, but every one of those official mental disorders is a total lie and a fraud because there is no diagnostic test for any of these disorders. Not ADHD, not bipolar, not depression, not schizophrenia, not anything that you've ever heard of that is a discrete mental disorder. If habit is thus the enormous flywheel of society and habit keeps us all within the bounds of ordinance, then it is our habits which enslave us to the so-called children of fortune for their fortune exists only because our habits prevent us from outpacing the status quo and growing in the light direction. How might we begin to change our habits such that our actions are no longer in conflict with our needs as individuals to survive and thrive in this world? And what will happen if we do not resist? We're heading toward a system where we're going to have economic collapse, real crisis, be much worse than anything we've seen. We're going to be in a position where most people won't understand how it came about. They won't realize that it's the result of government policies, of corrupt politicians, and so therefore they're going to go to those same corrupt politicians and endorse the same policies, and we're going to get more of the same. And that is where we're headed. It all goes back to people who are smarter than us, who are polymaths, who are organized and have a lot of office supplies and infinite money because they can print it out of thin air and everyone else takes it and says, this is real. That's not real. Your mind is real. Objective reality is real. Wisdom is valuable because we can learn how to survive together with that. But all these things that they make us think are valuable, like petroleum or any of these other commodities, they're all fear-based. If we just really understood what was going on in our voluntary role in it, we wouldn't play such a role in our own servitude. There's only one thing that we can do to change the courts that we're now on, and that is to recapture the system. All of the positions of power in America today, and to a large extent around the world, are in the hands of collectivists, people who believe in the very system we have. They like it. 